<coughs> the last um, speaker for this uh, panel is Sandra Lim. Sandra Lim's practice-based research looks at the potential of artist documentary for urban analysis and critique. Originally from Canada, she recently completed a PhD in art, design, and moving image media from the University of Brighton in the UK. Screening her thesis film underground in, vi in venues such as London International Documentary Film Festival and the Toronto Female Eye Film Festival in 2011 and 2012. Sandra is going to present on decoding urban space through artist documentary practice. Welcome, Sandra. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me today to talk about my research. Um, you can hear me. I recently, um, um, this paper is actually about my PhD, so it's kind of a condensation of a little bit of it. And um, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the aesthetic trajectory of my research uh, and to the potential. Okay, into the potential of um, a, a film tradition, an avant-garde film tradition in Britain called British Structural Materialist Films of the 60s and 70s. Um, and I'm looking at the potential um, of that aesthetic for a relational method of documentary practice and urban analysis through video instead of film. So. Um, So I'm just going to work through three parts. I'm going to give a bit of an introduction to the aesthetic because obviously not many people are familiar with it. And then um, I'm going to offer an alternative reading of one of the films which served as a base in terms of the artist method for my own practice. And then uh, I'm going to look at, take a little sidestep and just give you a brief example of how that original aesthetic tradition actually did develop into a kind of urban documentary film form, and which actually led me to ask, is there another way to use that aesthetic? Um, OK, so OK, so um, so yeah, so in the, so the last part I want to illustrate in my own practice-based research how I connected my theory and practice to a phenomenological understanding of the aesthetic as well as a relational approach to space through the writings of the French sociologist and philosopher Henri Lefebvre. Okay. Okay, so to begin with, um, the avant-garde uh, co-op film tradition of structural materialist films came to prominence in Britain in the late 60s and early 70s through the theoretical writings of uh, Malcolm Le Grice and Peter Goodall. Uh, who are practicing film artists today. Um, and um, it's in their film, um, according to Gadol, just to give you an idea of what, we're, what they were working with, um, Gadol, the, the formative period, according to Gadol, although some people sort of, there's different readings of the aesthetic, so I'll, I'll give you basically what they've sort of talked about historically. Um, of their own practice. So according to Gadol, the formative period of the tradition covered a period of roughly 10 years, um, 1966 to 76, emanating from the London Filmmakers Cooperative and it distinguished, he said, distinguished by the pursuit of the empirical real, the focus of which was upon non-representational and materialist film practice, um, which foregrounded the procedures and processes of making a film. Um, 
So for La Grace, simply, it just simply meant to film his film approach. Um, and this meant for him an emphasis upon the reality of the cinematic process and the treatment of film as material to be transformed through such procedures as re-photography of the original film strip. So to give you a, a, an example of what that looks like, um, this isn't the greatest uh, sort of capture of their films, because obviously this is being sort of mediated through video, which isn't how they would prefer their films to be seen. Oh, it's not playing. So this is this is just a quick clip of the Grace's seminal film called Little Dog for Roger, and it's just a, basically a little snippet of Super 8, uh, not Super 8, but um, a very old type of sort of amateur home video format called 9mm, I believe. Is there a way to make this bigger? how it played before. Okay, so as you can see, um, this is the process of re-photographing re the film strip and reworking it, um, thereby disrupting the, the normal rate of film and uh, projection and, and keeping intact the limits of the film frame and beyond. Okay. Another film. Now for for Peter Gadol, um, his method was slightly different in that it it actually took okay. So his method was more of a camera technique, a handheld camera technique. Um, I don't know if anybody knows anything about structural materialist films or, or American structural films, but they're known for their fixed frame lens and uh, very still kind of long takes, um, going back to Andy Warhol's films. So this is slightly different because he's doing kind of a minimalist film technique with a, a handheld camera. Mm -hmm. And the effect of this in this um, dimly lit room is very, um, you struggle to actualize yourself within this space. So, um, so, so before, okay. So it seemed that before the impact of materialist film could be fully registered in terms of the spectator's subjectivity the effects, and the effects of the perceptual and phenomenal engagement for the viewer that the actual experience of this, these kinds of films entailed, um, uh, it just seemed like it kind of got this very rigid label. And then um, um, around 1975, the eminent film uh, critic and filmmaker Peter Wollen um, wrote an article called the, in the two, called the two, two avant-garde, and he um, he basically criticized the aesthetic, um, saying that uh, it was too reductive to be anything but an exercise in extreme purism with an overemphasis upon the visual field. And he said that uh, cinema should actually be more about um, employing more than one channel and more than one sensory medium, medium, and it should be in line with all the other arts. So in hindsight, Willem's criticism could be viewed worthy for its promotion of a greater diversity of form, coming at a time um, from a new approach to film grounded in structural and semiotic 
a lot analysis of um, film as part of a larger wave of French structuralism, uh, which made its way into British film studies at the time, placing an emphasis upon signs and significations of the representational elements and structures of cinema. But looking back, um, Woolen's view also, in a way, uh, suggested that the visual experience of film only offers, or primarily offers, only one form of sensory engagement, and that being visual. And um, in more recent theories of uh, cinema spectatorship, we know that this isn't necessarily the case. As um, Laura Hugh Marx theorizes, moving images, whether they're produced in film or video, can also be experienced perceptually through haptic spectatorship and the body's sensory apparatus. So for example, um, perceptual spectatorship or haptic spectatorship involves uh, the experience of moving images in a different way to the spectatorship of optical moving images. Um, this is because um, you, you, uh, haptic spectatorship tends to promote a tactile sort of sense of cinema through the, the grain of video, um, through decay in video and through film. So both film and video are, can be haptic, experienced haptically. And um, in addition, these sorts of experiences become the building blocks for um, the incorporation of more um, effective knowledge, potentially, and such as, such as uh, sens sensations or feelings of dissociation or the embodiment of memories. Um, so soon after Willen's critical piece appeared, um, I think uh, there was a noticeable change in, in how um, Luke Rice and Gidal talked about their films, and they came in line more with um, an idea of a, their approach, their filmic approach being a counter-cinema approach. And, um, and this was uh, basically seen as a polemic against state and corporate cinema. So in a way, it kind of bypassed uh, Woolen's criticism rather effectively. But I'd like to look at Peter Will or Peter Goodall's room film a little bit in a little bit more detail um, from a I can't even say that phenomenological perspective. Um, so, simply described, I'm not, I just might play the game while I'm talking, so you can kind of get a sense of it. Um, it's a film seemingly composed of a series of single long duration shots over the course of about 50 minutes, which trace the barely perceptible grainy outlines and dimensions of a dimly lit room and its contents. And this is through the first person um, handheld camera. Um, but overlooking that technique in itself um, and calling it anti-illusionist and count a form of counter cinema overlooks how the, the sense of limited movements and constraint, um, which the filmmaker's first person and subjective camera actually, how it actually becomes embodied by the viewer as an actual struggle. So if you were, this minute, this film is about 55 minutes long, and if you were in um, a darkened room watching this, um, progressively, you would start to feel anxious, like you were enduring a kind of anxious struggle yourself. And arguably, this is a meaningful experience in, a, in and of itself. Um, uh, moods are, like, feelings and moods are important um, in terms of the experience of, um, just in terms of an everyday experience. Um, for example, the German phenom phenomenologist um, Martin Heidegger proposes that moods are the primary way in which um, a human being comes to know in a visceral way his or her state of mind uh, in the everyday, and therefore having a mood or finding oneself in a mood uh, may be thought of as a form of disclosure um, and a way of bringing ourselves into an awareness of our own presence in the world. In fact, what Heidegger's theory suggests um, is that the experience of moods in the context of the experience of a film, and especially a film like this, which structures the spectatorship of the viewer as the object of a film, um, is that this becomes a reflective device in a way which facilitates an examination of one's own state of being. So in this way, the sense of struggle that you feel in viewing this film and the way it progresses um, uh, may actually be a similar process of an existential engagement, which the perceptual, the haptic sort of exp um, experience of the film sets in motion. 
And so um, this can be felt, if you were to watch the film, um, as a sense of uh, the filmmaker's camera um, adopting his perspective and feeling it almost as kind of in one way controlling, but then in another way kind of letting go. And so in some ways you struggle with him and against him while you're watching this film. And part of that sense of struggling is enhanced by this sense of um, being released. And this comes with moments in the film, uh, in the actual original aesthetic, the, the film would um, give way to the end of the reel of the film and it would sort of white out. And so in a way that becomes in this part of the experience where you're released from that struggle, from um, sort of struggling with the, the filmmaker's perspective. So in a way then, the spectatorship of room film engenders a sense of struggle which comes, which involves coming to terms with a shared subjectivity between ourselves, the viewer, and that of the filmmaker's perspective, um, which we then embody. And the feeling of control unfolds and as, as the film continues on, you're not sure when it's going to end. So your anxiety level uh, builds. And then when the film's over, that anxiety level for you hasn't left you because it's still there and you're still experiencing it. At least that's kind of how I experience a film and a lot of other people who kind of come out of it after talk about feeling really anxious and some people talk about um, that feeling also with Andy Warhol's um, films. So um, Heidegger says that uh, it's through anxiousness that we come face to face with our own most state of being. This is the most primal mood you can have. And uh, he says that which we're anxious about is being in the world itself. So in a way, it's, it's um, in a way, an awakening of your political consciousness in relation to your own every day. So, um, this film became an aspect, uh, an important aspect for my developing aesthetic. Um, I, I'll skip through because I've got five minutes left. Um, I, I wanted to see how this aesthetic had, had developed into documentary in terms of an urban documentary form. And um, I came up with, beginning with like around 1976, all the way up to the present, a kind of a tendency for the aesthetic um, in terms of documentary towards a kind of a, a form which kind of lost a bit of what Gadol had developed and picked up a lot of the materialist practice um, as a way to decenter the idea of documentary. Um, so the example I'm going to show you is, is actually more of this adopting of this fixed frame long take to sort of destabilize your idea of, or to immerse you in, the, in what you're seeing. Um, but what ended up happening um, was this, this form became a kind of a uh, reflexive form of film. So the way that this filmmaker is structuring um, your point of view is very much you are a voyeur. Then that look gets flashed back on you and you realize that you are looking as much as being revealed to be the looker. And that's in the appearance of the reverse shot with the person filming from the window. Okay. So, um, and more recent, uh, more recently, the uh, International Documentary Festival in Amsterdam um, has coined this type of documentary as paradocumentary, um, meaning films that show that they are films, 
There are films that may bring you to another place in time, or there and then, but they'll always let you know that it's a construction that you are looking at. So in my own practice, I wanted to take a different approach with the aesthetic, and especially in the one film that I'll show you a clip of, um, referring back to Peter Goodall's um, uh, creative method of practice. I wanted to find a way to bring about a more existential form of encounter and engagement with the familiar yet shifting ground of the urban and the everyday, based on a relational understanding of the viewer as subject and object through the or spectatorship of the film. So this led me to consider Henri Lefebvre's conception of space. Um, as, as example, uh, uh, Lefebvre says that um, social space or urban reality um, in social space or the idea of it, no one element defines the whole since space is neither a subject nor an object but rather a social reality. Um, a social reality that is a, a set of relations and forms. So he's not considering space in terms of a container paradigm. Okay. And uh, my, based on this, uh, I, I came up with the idea of uh, the idea of Gidal's practice as a gestural, immersive practice, and I wanted to uh, take that into my own practice in a way. I wonder if I should just show you my clip and then maybe people can ask questions after. So it's, it's a little long. So basically, I, I ended up making um, a documentary about the London Underground, and this was during the period of the, the um, terrorist bombings, although I started just before. And um, so my work kind of overlapped with this, and I set my project aside because I wasn't sure how to deal with that reality in, um, you know, a, a very respectful way. So waiting a space of time, I came back to it. And, and in retrospect, that made kind of sense because what began there and kind of looking back, having that perspective actually helped me to uh, um, come up with a, a, an idea of, not an idea, but a way of going about it, um, which led to a number of versions of the film almost. Um, in some ways, I used a, uh, um, I went through one version adding music and another version I went through and added uh, um, just the sound effects. I'm not sure where my No, no, it's okay. Let's just go. Okay, so um, so basically, I developed an approach which, taking this idea of a relational understanding of space, that a lot of different things feed into it, like symbolic, um, cultural, historical, um, perceptual, um, a lot of different. Taking all these ideas, I I just kind of went with each version um, and fed basically the memory of the time into the practice. And um, so this took effect as um, kind of the immersive idea of the camera, long takes, reflections, field notes, um, combining with um, um, interpretations, musical interpretations, and sound interpretations. So in fact, what I ended up doing was taking Gidal's method, and where his, where much of his camera technique was reliant upon the um, uh, the relation to the image in terms of there not being very much to see, I played with the idea of the sound and working around the sound and the image, um, creating gaps and a resolution in, in the sound track. So this first version is just this is going to work. It's just a the sounds of the train. The 
version, not the parable version. It just became the times. And this was based on the idea of um, the rhetoric of the time, of carrying on as usual, but also feeling that pressure and that anxiety of the actual being in a, a place under threat of terror. So I will stop here. Um, I lost my place in terms of all this presentation notes, so hopefully that made sense. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.